The text that I will be preaching on this morning comes from the 45th chapter of the book of Genesis. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. <clears throat> Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed they were at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So for those of you who come here regularly, you know me as the pastor's husband who normally sits right there with two kiddos each Sunday. Though sometimes chasing or wrangling might be a little bit more accurate than sitting. And today I have the privilege both of teaching this morning's adult education class and trying to bring a word from the Lord on this text from the book of Genesis. This text brings us to the life of Joseph, a patriarch of the faith, the favorite son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And if it is recorded in the Hebrew Bible for us to know this reality, then you better believe that his brothers knew that he was his mother and his father's favorite as well. We know those secrets tend to live in plain daylight. And it was being their favorite, as well as his dreams of grandeur, combined with his brother's resentment that resulted in his being beaten and left for dead by his own kin, left face down in a ditch only to be sold into slavery. His body was bruised and bloody, and his heart was broken. And so it is against that backdrop that we hear this morning's text, where Joseph, after many years, meets his brothers face to face. And it is that juxtaposition that makes today's text so meaningful. We see and hear Joseph as he is living well, as he has all the power, influence, and possessions that he could want. And it is in this very different context that he is confronted with his brothers. But of course, even more, he is confronted by his broken heart. His broken heart that if he is anything like the rest of us, that he is wont to lock away in a closet never to return to again. You see, it is so easy to take our heartbreak, 
our shattered dreams and our real feelings about ourselves and bury them in the pit in our backyard or in the pit of our soul as we come to church and come to God with a smile on our face. What we miss out on is that we need not hide the pit of our lives from God. Instead, it might be precisely in the pit where we meet God. I'll say that again. It might be precisely in the pit that we meet God. You see, I'm convinced that what breaks God's heart more than anything else is that we don't bring our broken hearts to God. One of the deepest privileges of my life is that for my job, I get to help people bring their experience of reality, especially their most heartbreaking realities, and their faith a little bit closer together. You see, there is way too much faith that lives over here while reality remains over there, or way out there, and never shall the two meet. But in my role as a hospital chaplain, as I spend time in the hospital room, there are certain realities that we cannot turn our eyes away from, certain realities that denial will not erase, and so we must face them like Joseph faced his brothers. And then we have to wrestle with how this most painful reality and our faith might intersect. What if we didn't bury our tears in our pillow and then offer our happy prayers to God? What if those very tears were the stuff of our prayers, or as the Apostle Paul refers to them, those sighs that are too deep for words? I'm guessing that at this point you've gathered that my vocation tends to live on the very worst days of people's lives when reality comes crashing in, and faith must deal with those broken hearts. It is surely not always an easy thing to do each day, but even more so, it is a remarkable privilege. Reality might be here, and faith might be over there, and our path is to bring them together. So in the good Lord's kindness, we are given a text this morning that is relevant to every one of us in this room, a text about heartbreak, about sibling rivalry, of jealousy, of favoritism, of revenge, of confrontation, that is, of meeting each other face to face. We're given this text in which most of us likely identify with Joseph rather than his brother's. Though in some ways, probably all of us have been some of each at different points. Perhaps some of us have also been their heartbroken father as well. And so we have all these different narrative entry points into this text, and it couldn't be any more relevant. And while we're at it, scripture is just chock full of sibling rivalries and conflicts. The fourth chapter of the Bible contains a sibling homicide. Later in the book, there is the favoring of Isaac over Ishmael. Then Isaac's son Jacob deceives his father and steals his brother Esau's blessing. Laban then deceives Jacob into marrying his less desirable daughter before he then has to serve time until he can marry his beloved Rachel. And now that very Jacob, has been, who has been the duper and the duped, occupies a third role that of the bereaved father over the disappearance or murder of this beloved child, of his beloved wife, Rachel. So that's where we get just in the first book of the Bible about sibling rivalries. So when someone tells you they have good biblical values, ask them which biblical values, because this book seems to have more stories of things going wrong than going right. And we hear this history in Joseph's speech, which he must have practiced so many times before when he was brushing his teeth in front of the mirror or counting sheep before drifting off to sleep. 
Think about the people who have left you for dead in some way or another. How many times have you rehearsed your moment of reckoning with them? And so here he is, with the balance of power shifted decisively in his favor. He's got Pharaoh in his hip pocket, and his brothers have come as hungry beggars. He couldn't get much closer to having his foot on their neck. And to add to it, he has intelligence that they don't. He knows who they are, and they have no idea who he is. And even more, when he reveals his identity, they must have felt some mix of deep shame for having wronged him and utter terror for what he might do to them. He's got all the cards, and they have none. He's playing chess, and they're playing apples to apples. And if he is anything like me, maybe like some of you too, that has to feel pretty good. We know that being utterly powerless and beaten is the stuff of trauma, and he is no longer powerless, and he won't be left for dead or sold into slavery this time. If anything, he is the one who could have beaten or enslaved them. So we might be in the Hebrew Bible still far before the birth of Jesus, but this might as well be Joseph's come-to-Jesus moment. And so this well-honed speech of his, or precisely one version of that speech, comes to our ears as Joseph steps forward on the stage and is squarely in the spotlight. And he says, It was not you who sent me here, but God. What they meant for evil, God has turned to good. What was a complete tragedy at one point has become a central point of meaning in his life. It is the hinge that has swung this door wide open into his life in Egypt that has opened the door to this moment of reckoning between Joseph and himself, between Joseph and his brothers, between Joseph and God. So remember how I talked about how my job is to help people at the intersection of their most painful realities and their faith. Well, this reality with Joseph is where the reality of his deep pain and the reality of his faith come together. And it yields that line, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph, who was left for dead in the pit, can almost be heard in Psalm 103, which is actually attributed to King David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who redeems your life from the pit. What a remarkable affirmation of faith for someone who has known life in the pit. So while the authorship of this psalm is attributed to David, It could just as easily be Joseph or probably just about any of us here, sitting in the pews, standing in the back as ushers, sitting in the choir stalls, or standing in this pulpit. Because, of course, you know, our faith is not just about Jesus being raised from the dead. It is also about all those other deaths that populate our lives, both real and metaphorical, and being met with an empty tomb. Our faith is about reality and all its starkness being met with a faith that is just as real, if not more. It is a faith of God redeeming our lives from the pits that we have known. And if you don't know what your pit is, it is often what leaves you with a pit in your stomach. 
What if God's promise is to redeem even and especially that? You see, we often get God's covenant wrong. It was never that we wouldn't find ourselves in a pit or two. It was never that we wouldn't feel that pit in our stomach. It was that God would redeem our lives from the pit. And if we're going to take an even more honest look at our lives in relation to this text, it is that the pits that we find ourselves in are not always pits that others have thrown us into. Sometimes they are the pits that we have dug for ourselves. The Apostle Paul asks why we do the thing that we do not want. He's asking the question of why would we do the very things we know will bring destruction to ourselves and to others? Why do we sin when we know better? And again, God's promise is not that God will redeem us from the pits that we have been thrown into. It is also that God will redeem us from the very pits that we have dug for ourselves. And it is that promise that allowed Joseph, that allows us to step forward on that stage of life as all the lights go off around us and the spotlight beams right down on us. And we have to reckon with our siblings, our spouse, our kids, our parents, our co-workers, our friends. What do we do with our pain? For God and others. If you're anything like me, you will likely stop short of saying that it was good that that event that put you in the pit happened. But I do imagine that many of us have wound up in places where we are grateful for who we have become on the other side of those tragedies. I can tell you for certain that there isn't a chance in hell or heaven that I'd be here in a place like this, especially standing in this spot if I hadn't spent significant seasons of life in that pit. And maybe you wouldn't be where you are either. When Joseph stands before his brothers, their faces likely flush with shame, their stomachs fill with anxiety, and their hearts race with panic. On a visceral level, they are sure that their brother will enact a future that is governed by the past. It is only human. It's the way we presume life will always be, that we will get what we have coming to us, that whether we are the one thrown in the pit or the one thrown in, that our life will not be redeemed from the pit. I have a dear friend who lives across the country, whose mother had him when she was only a teenager. She planned to put him up for adoption because he was born, because she, when he was born, she was young and unmarried. And so to give birth to him was to lose him. Because of her grief that she hadn't had the chance to fully work through, she held on to him for as long as possible. During the fourth day of labor, they finally had to use forceps to deliver him. It turned out that the forceps would forever leave a mark on his life in the form of cerebral palsy. This reality of his birth and his disability has led him many places. He has spent plenty of time in the pit, to be sure. Ultimately, he went into a profession that bore the mark of this wound and also gave it deep meaning for both him and for the world. You see, he is a psychologist that specializes in working with people who have deep grief and are trying to learn how to let go. He has found a vocation that brings him alive, connected to the very reality that threatened his life. And he helps other people to do some of the most important work we will ever do with our lives. The very experience that threatened his life has now become a deep love for and a deep connection to life. This friend of mine knows something of what Joseph has known. 
of having found oneself in the pit and having known that redemption that God can bring to our lives. So what pit have you known in your life? What redemption have you known? What pit are you in now? And what redemption are you waiting for now? Bless the Lord, O my soul, for he has redeemed our lives from the pit. And to go one step further, studies have shown that cancer patients, that they tend to experience a deep vibrancy of spirituality, faith, and God precisely when in the throes of chemotherapy and radiation. Not always. But more often than not, their faith, their experience of God, tends to deepen precisely in those pits. It both makes no sense and it makes perfect sense that people who experience the fear that accompanies cancer and the suffering that comes with cancer treatment can tend to feel closer to God than they have ever been in their lives. Isn't that something? I happened to see it most days at work. And I saw it as a son 10 years ago when my own mother, just days before her death and with tears in her eyes, told me about how much she hoped she would recover and get to keep her life. And yet, and yet she went on to say that even while her body had been riddled with cancer, She had never known God's love quite so clearly in her whole life. She whispered to her baby boy, I'd love to lose the cancer, but I don't want to lose God. You see, she knew something about the hard work of bringing faith and reality together. And so these patients and my mother are telling me, are telling us, that not only do we rejoice when God redeems our lives from the pit, but also we have the privilege and the deep joy of worshiping a God and being in spiritual communion with a God who meets us in the pit, who gets in the pit with us. So it seems, after all, that when God redeems our life from the pit, or even gets in the pit with us, it seems that we are no longer longer able to hold reality over here and our faith over here. Instead, God has told us that our reality matters deeply to the heart of God. This seems to be the spiritual mystery of what Joseph is proclaiming in his dramatic truth It is not you, but God. God was with me even then. And so spend some time this Sunday afternoon, opening the closets of your heart that you might have shut off from God, of considering the ugly hurts that we often cover up when we wear our Sunday best, and of contemplating how it is that God has and might still meet you in the pit. As a mentor of mine is wont to say, the mystery of life is learning to love reality. Even with all its messiness and brokenness, to learn to love reality, and precisely in coming to love reality, to discover that God is present. Bless the Lord, O my soul. For he has met us in the pit, and he has redeemed our life from the pit, and he will redeem our lives from the pit. May it be so among us. Amen.